there are a few things my mother knew that she put in her heart. She didn't tell me up until a season came, especially after when I finished year seven. She started noticing that my trust is different. She waited to see my convictions around my encounters. After two years, she told me, she's suggesting that I should go to Lagos and start ministry. She didn't have money, but she gave me 200,000. A, a man around me offered me some money. It was a lot of money, up to a million. And he said that he wants us to you know, iron out this ministry together. Let him, you know, an Eastern sees anything, including ministry, as, as a, a transactional. Is um, is hedonistic? You know what a hedonistic ministry is? What you have with um, a native doctor? My name is Apostle Dudechko. I'm the president of Revival Hub Ministries International. We saw a vision some years ago of what God intended to do and the vision implicated our lives. Uh, actually, um, we saw a hub, a center that has become something of an exporter of the purposes that is in the heart of God. And God began to tell us if we will obey Him and come to the point where we have crystallized that burden that is in His heart, he can, through us, export that purpose and intent to people and to the nations of the world. It's not so long, though I've been in discipleship for many years now, many years, about 11 years, and, but the ministry as Revival Hall started about um, three years ago. And uh, that was when we got leave from God and then from authorities um, over us to um, start the work. At, and we were led to start um, at Ne. We have time for well, a few considerations and then waiting on God to be sure of the exact location that we'll be able to host what God intends to do. I am. Do you know what I am? Do you know what we have done before coming here? Because before I came into campus, my father has already ordained me a pastor in training, meaning that it's just a matter of time when the full thing. So I felt, you know, there is this religious cage that is there. And in that one moment of prophetic teaching, the um, servant of God was able to break through to me. So I felt whatever they are doing, I might not fully understand it, but there must be something correct about it. So when I came for that session, a few of them have known that there is something about me that is a little bit off from what they are. So they weren't expecting me to receive. So there were people more expressive, and in one, two, five, ten minutes on the average, many of them received, except I. So, and they were like trying to postpone my own uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit, I, in that setting, I just prayed to God. I said, I just feel this is correct. And it seems as if I'm not receiving. I said, if it is your way, if this is correct, please give me the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't up to a few moments. I began to speak in tongues. So they gave us instructions. They said we should go back and pray in tongues for one hour and do it maybe for some time. Well, I don't know what others did, but I think I took my instructions personal. I went back to my hostel in Injoko, and then I prayed in tongues one hour every night for one semester. That became the beginning of the great things that God began to do in my life. I likened my experience like someone that had a, a lot of wood, but there was no fire, there was no kindly. There was no activation, a lot of things that I have. Obviously, a lot of things locked up in my ordination, a lot of probably abilities that is there that I never felt that I should be amongst the people that should be doing this. You know, as a matter of fact, I, over time, because of the 
difficulty in having this experience, I um, got to learn everything I could about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the number one significance is that God used me to help a lot of people in this matter. Hard cases was very easy with, with me. We would say, Bishop, big men of God, as many start to them, they could not. I said, God, my own was like an encounter. So I was, I was able to re, you know, relate with their challenges, almost all kinds of cases. I researched possible challenges, possible limitations that can stop people. I, I found out that you cannot make much progress in God except you begin to speak in tongues for long. I had myself as an experiment because a lot of things began to happen in my life. Boldness came, understanding came, clarity came. I, I was able to sort out the important things in my work with God. Initially, it didn't start as a prayer escapade. I have to say that. It started as, I felt is a window that opened up for me to explore more of God. In this context, it becomes easier for me to juxtapose with my academics. Now, initially, I did not understand all this, but um, God began to explain to me for that that um, there is no difference between my fellowship with God, my service with God, and my life in general. One of the mistakes that people make, especially in school, in campus, in this matter is that they try to separate their academics, my academic life, financial life, and all that. Satan takes advantage of that. You see, something has to flow around. The implication of that is that we cannot really say when you are praying, when you are studying, I can switch over anytime. So I began to learn how to practice my faith all the time. So it is not something of sort like, um, I will pray one hour, I will pray in the night, then I will read. No, I even pray when we have breaks, you know, in between classes. I find myself in a completed building, I take one hour because I feel that there shouldn't be a separation. Either of them can come in between at any time. What is important is that I have discipline concerning those matters. Once you have discipline, it will not, except you don't have discipline, once you have discipline, I think the two of them can go together as long as you want them. I can switch over in breaks. The fundamentals of ministry demand that people should learn a lot of things in the secret, hidden. You know, that affords you a lot of opportunity to learn, make mistakes, find out about people, find out about ministry, find out about direction, find out about the niche that God wants you to fill in. See, because according to Paul in the book of um, Colossians, he said that even though Jesus has suffered and done everything, there is a quota of suffering that he has allotted to man for his body's sake. Now, Jesus has suffered but for what he got to reach the body, somebody has to suffer. You see, so it is within this period that we began to find out. That period gave me opportunity to find out my strength, find out my direction, find out my um, specifics, find out how and seasons. I understood the seasons of my life, the seasons of my ministry personally. I got to know that I have a five-year cycle around my life. Uh, personally, I, I got to find out that I have strength in raising people. Personally, I got to find out that um, I have strength in prayers. I didn't like prayers when I started, but it's in discipleship that I found out, though I didn't like prayer, it seems as if prayer liked me, so we continued. My family is conservative, but I cannot say that prayer is foreign. This is because my parents are ministers of the gospel. And what they had was like also a prayer and prophetic ministry. 
more so than like a partnership. My father is the more prophetic, in fact, he's the prophet. And then my mother is prophetic too, but she is the prayer person. So I saw her pray a lot. I wonder too. It's not as if prayer is strange. What is strange is praying in the spirit and praying in tongues. And a lot of the endeavor we had in prayer was is good, but it was limited because many of them sprang from the soul. But when we prayed in the spirit, the Holy Spirit took advantage of that to build our spirit, which is the fundamental um, um, purpose of praying in the spirit and praying in tongues. So I cannot say, I did not really have a lot of challenge in the matters of prayer because I already have a family that is given to God. Even though they have um, reservations with what they termed extreme, because many of those times, you know, I stayed back in school. I didn't go home for breaks. I was just trying to explore the new things that I found in God. And for me to do that, I might have to stay back a few times. A, a season came in my life when I began to understand that God wants to do something different with my life. Remember, I've said before now that my parents are pastors and they have started their work on their own. It is quite confusing for me initially because I almost always thought that all it means is for me to just continue what they are doing. So, but a time came, I think in my 400 level, my penultimate year in the campus, I began to notice that God is doing something different with my life. That he's emphasizing on a lot of things that is actually absent in my father's work. I initially did not understand it. I was, I was just after God. I didn't have any intention of starting of anything or pioneering anything. I was serving under a man of God, you know, Reverend Vincent Jones. So I almost always wanted to continue with him. In fact, at some point, I, I was uh, told to start something, you know, under that umbrella. But when I went back, I almost started, but I just said, let me just press more in case God says something else. Actually, I was waiting for God to say just continue. But after praying for two weeks, I found that God wanted me not to continue with that. I was too afraid to tell him, so I kept quiet for long until the man had to meet me and say, I asked you, what's, what's the feedback? I told him, well, I, I can say now ignorantly, I told him that God told me to go back to my father. I told him, because as of them, my father has a ministry. You know, that was what made it easier for him to understand. At least somebody going back to his father that has a ministry to help him out and all that. Actually, that's what I thought. But when I went back, I stayed with my father. This is now um, the period between graduation and youth service. So um, I left because that was the time I had an encounter with the Lord Jesus. So a lot of things came afresh in my life. I labored for the ministry sometimes. I fast for 30 days or more, nine days, seven days. Many of them not for myself, but to see if we can push the work forward. Because as of then, we have started having some snacks around the work that my father had. And it's a work that is found within the village setting. A lot of challenges for him, which translated to challenges to me, being that I'm part of the family you know, and all that. And uh, many of those inherited challenges um, became the trust of my body initially. It was an attempt to see if I can, you know, solve it or help him or help in the work. It was when I fasted for long, after some point, I began to get feelers that it is not just that God told me not to continue with the initial work of my pastor, that it seems as if he wants to do something different with my life. You know, um, there are a few things I can now say in hindsight, you know, but then it wasn't so clear. So as God will have it, with the strength and wave of those fresh encounters, I found myself 
you know, in my youth service here. I think that's the second most important season of my life. That was when my encounters were honed into convictions. You know, by the time I came back, um, I knew that God is doing something strong in my life. I tried to incorporate it back into what my father is doing. But it was like a new wine in an old wine skin. It never fitted him. You know, there are a few things my father was strongly against, and they were my strengths. And I cannot uh, stand and tell him that he's wrong. So, you know, these are the ways God speaks. And of course, you cannot rebel against authority. What I did is that he gave me opportunity to learn how to be submissive even when it didn't go my way. So for those few years, that's what happened. But one thing was consistent. God wanted me to start something and it is not what my father is doing. I didn't want to accept it because it looked odd. I mean, how can I tell people that and all that? So I have to hide it in my heart. At some point, after I prayed, prayed, one of the key guiding lights that happened is, just like Jesus had with his mother Mary, there are a few things my mother knew that she put in her heart. She didn't tell me up until a season came, especially after when I finished you serving, she started noticing that my trust is different. She waited to see my convictions around my encounters. After two years, she told me, she's suggesting that I should go to Lagos and start a ministry. She didn't have money, but she gave me 200,000. She said she would give me anyway. And um, she said she feels God wants me to start something different. That she can't leave her husband because God called the two of them. But I should go. And she told me a few personal prophecies that went ahead before I was born and even when I was very small because they too were part of a prayer and prophetic move in the eastern part of Nigeria. And in one of those sessions, the prophet spoke over my life and they said something strategic. It was then that um, she kept it in her heart, but when she saw what was happening in my life, she was convinced that even from origin, God intended to do something different. That um, partly what um, the ministry of my father to do for me is to create for me an environment to hone my skills, you know, and all that. So after that um, season, we began to um, try to see if within the context of my father's ministry, whether some of these things can still find a space. I was insistent, trying to see, can't we find an agreement between these two, you know, but it's now that I understand some of the statements that my father made. I was too young and I was too passionate. I didn't have enough, enough wisdom. So some of those days, we say that God gave him vision. And it is not what I'm doing that is his vision. I said, but I'm your son. I mean, everything should flow together. Well, one thing led to the other. A lot of persecutions came out and uh, it was not possible for me to continue in that scenario. And, uh, January 2018, I was on my way to a crusade in Kaduna. So when I came there, or rather before I went there, I, I, I passed through Makode. I The year previous year, 2017, I came for the International Eagles Conference. So I felt Makode is on the way to Kaduna. So let me just pass through. You know, I came for the uh, normal January prophetic verses after that. So from the house that is my father in the Lord Apostle Romero's house, I stayed there after that. I went from there to for the program. A lot of things happened. In fact, that was one of my most anointed days in my life. A lot of things happened, broken bones. The move, it was on the street and the move of God was so strong. But when I came back, I tried to pick my bag at the house to go back home. And I had an experience. I normally have that experience 
when God is insistent in making sure I don't make mistakes. Now, if I go a little bit back, you remember I said that there was a time I tried to go to Lagos or I was cancelled to go to Lagos. What happened is that I actually wanted to go to Lagos and I finished packing my bag and my friend was waiting for me. We were about to go and start up something over there. In the morning, as I was about to pick my bag to go, I felt a hand hold me on the shoulders. And once that angel holds me on the shoulders, I will know that God is so insistent that this mistake will not be managed. You know, there are mistakes that can be managed, necessary mistakes, but this cannot be managed. So when I came to Makonde, I felt a strong restraint to stay back. For the next three, four, five, six months, ministry halted. And in fact, God went as much as telling me, you know, to tell people I'm a pastor all that time. Oh, it was not fun. But that period helped me to separate myself, win myself from what I came from. You see, because it is necessary for you to be weaned from that. I was weaned and it was not a pleasant period, but it was a necessary period. It was also a period that God brought me into a new authority because the authority I had over me before then was not suitable to bring me to the place of my destiny. It was also a period that God gave me a clear cut direction, especially as a matter, as a borders on location. At that point, I was still fighting location. That location issue, I fought it for five years. But after that, I got a strong leading that God is taking me back to the East. And not just East. I tried to stop at Enugu. He said, go back. As I was going, I tried to stop at Oka. He said, no, go back. So God took me back to my village. It was hard. It was hard for two reasons. One, I know one, I know that ministry in my place is very hard. It is not just that ministry is hard, the ministry by an indigenous is far harder. Indigenous don't survive in ministry there. And secondly, my father also has a ministry and he's still alive and he's still in the same place. How do a young man come back and tell them that he has a call in the same village with his father? It was so tough for me that even when my father and the Lord prayed for me, what I decided to do is to go back and continue with my father's ministry, probably take over from him and then change a few things to fit my own calling. You know, and after the prayer, I went back and my father told me openly that his calling is different from my own. So I have to enter into another season. I, God made my heart strong. And uh, after a 21 days night vigil with my four sisters, especially, and then my mother, a few friends came around and God told me to start meeting two times during the weekdays. If you come, pray and do Bible study, and then you can go. So we started off Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And, uh, this is 2019. That's how Revival Hope came about. 2017, one, if a, a man around me offered me some money. It was a lot of money, up to a million. And he said that he wants us to you know, iron out this ministry together. Let him, you know, an Eastern sees anything, including ministry, as, as a, a transactional. Is, um, is hedonistic. You know, what a hedonistic ministry is what you have with um, a native doctor. I mean, you come to him, you don't necessarily need to have a relationship with him. All you need is to give him something, pay, and then he gives you the results you want, and then you go. And so that is a, a very big challenge. In fact, when I started, a woman came and told me, this way you are doing ministry, nobody will come to your church. How can you just be praying and you are not praying for people's needs? You know, somebody came and told me that all I need is to make sure that, because 
you know, Newe is a business hub. As a matter of fact, Eastern Nigeria, but most especially Newe and Onicha, and they are close together. I mean, so people come from Onicha to some of our meetings and they go back the same day. So the man said that all I need to do is to get to know how to help people in business survive, pray for their business, and then I will be sorted out in life. But the, the, the burden in me cannot be sorted with money. The implication of that is that many people did not join me. They refused to join me. And for long, we prayed alone, three, four people, five people. We come for meetings and we sit on the ground. For long, as long as more than a year, we are just, we are just praying. We are just praying. We are just praying. I might not have the time to explain the the mystery that God taught me about setting up territorial lampstand. If you can obey God to that extent, a season will come, people will be compelled to come, not because they like you, but because God has set up something in the territory and He is willing to tell people to gather around it. So that's how we broke out from the Spirit. We, I knew the reason why I pray the way I pray is because I knew that there is no other way to survive except to break forth from the Spirit. No help is coming. The people have already told me they are not coming. And any ministry that can't help the evil man's pocket is not, it's not, going, in, it's not going anywhere. So first challenge is obviously financial challenge. Nobody is willing to bring the money that. So, but thank God, God has begun to deal with us on the issue of money and mammon and all that. So if God called you to that kind of territory, the first thing is that the God mammon has to go there. Another challenge is that the environment is very religious. It means that people talk a lot about God, but they don't really know the God there. They are serving a lot of religious postures to what God is trying to do. So these are the two fundamental things that we need to break down. And considering the fact that I'm in my village, I know it might not be another person's village. So a lot of these guys used to know me. So they asked since when did God now start using Chiedu? That's the way they say it in my language. So many of the time, once in a while, people, how God got to, you know, encourage us once in a while is that people that knew us from elsewhere, from campus, from youth service, they come around to benefit from what God gave to us, even though they let us go back. But it encourages us in the sense that it helps us to know that even though this setting has not yet accepted what we are doing, it doesn't negate the fact that it is something consistent with God's mind. The state of the society, obviously, can be traced to the church. And we are saying this not meaning that the church causes all the ills of the society, but that the church is supposed to be um, a, a, a colonizing um, institution meaning that if the church is found you know the bible said in the book of acts there was a testimony about the apostles and they said these men that turned the city upside down they are here again it means that when the apostles appear in a place there is something in them there is something in them that can turn the whole city up. just give them time the bible spoke about paul and he said that he came to the Areopagus and he began to teach the Bible. And the scripture said that so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. And then a whole, the whole of Asia Minor came under the authority of that man's ministry and the kingdom of God was expanded. Now, we understand that if the society is becoming more corrupt, it means that the church is to be held accountable in proxy, not as if we directly cost it, but God has given us something that should make sure that those things don't happen. 
God has given us something to transform the society. God has given us something that the gate of hell cannot withstand. Irrespective of the fact that the gate of hell can be just busting. But what we have is so stronger that Satan cannot stop it. Now, the challenge is that many times people are not willing to take responsibility to the tune that will be sufficiently equipped to counter what darkness has. Because as the day goes by, darkness is increasing in their skills and maneuver. That means that we have to increase in what we are doing. So we have to upgrade our capacities in engaging spiritual disciplines such that we will be competent partners of heaven so that God's um, purpose can flow through us. You see, God is demanding more from us because Satan has been given opportunity to test all of his abilities. It is captured in the prophecies. And the intent of God is that no matter what Satan does, the church will still have what it takes to douse him out. God is trying to prove in the last days that he has so much hope and faith in the church that they will be able to overcome everything that darkness is able to throw to them. And if that is true, we have to believe and trust and partner God in every way possible so that darkness can be pushed back. You see, God has done what he can do and he will be doing what he can do, but we need to do what is given to us to do and do it for so long, for so long, that it will overflow and conquer our society.